I've had three girlfriends in my life. My current girlfriend who I've been with for three years happily, my first girlfriend in college, and my second girlfriend Kelly. Kelly was someone who put me through hell emotionally and sometimes physically. I'll start from the beginning. Kelly and I matched on Bumble, and upon seeing that we both attended the same college, we based our conversation off that and any people that we may have mutually known. After seeing each other for about a month, we made it official, and we dated for about six months. Like most relationships, at first everything seemed great, and we got along fine. But the illusion of being a happy couple faded after a few months, when Kelly would start becoming very controlling and downright obsessive over knowing what I was doing at all times. The longer we dated, the more I realized she didn't have many friends at all, maybe one or two, that's about it. So when I would go out to see my friends on the weekends without her, she would always obsessively text me every 15 minutes asking me for proof of where I was. If I were ever to be at a bar without her, she'd throw a fit. She'd make me share my location with her after four or five months of dating. It got to the point I couldn't handle it anymore. She had too much time on her hands to worry about what I was doing constantly. I couldn't even go see my friends without constantly being attacked and interrogated by her. But one night, things escalated far worse than they ever had. Admittedly, I ended up at a bar and very drunk with a group of my drinking buddies. We started at my friend Kevin's house, and I didn't intend on ending up at a bar. When I got home, Kelly was waiting in front of my mom's house for me, with a batshit crazy look on her face. This was one of the first nights that she laid hands on me, repeatedly hitting me while screaming I'm a dirty cheater and other insane things, all while outside causing a scene for the neighbors to hear. After I had to grab her arms to get her to stop, she shouted things like, get off me, I'm calling the police. So I let go and told her we're done. This was officially when I broke up with her and her response was not good. Every single day, I received paragraphs upon paragraphs, ranging from angry to alleged regretfulness back to angry. Eventually, I felt more comfortable blocking Kelly for a while, but that wasn't the end. One of my friends who followed her on Instagram still sent me a screenshot of the picture she posted with this big, ugly, muscular guy who looked like he wanted to kill the person taking the picture. I made a joke to my friend saying, wow, I see she upgraded. Kelly did the unimaginable though. I was all cozy in my bed, in the perceived safety of the house. I was home alone as I usually was living in my parents' house. That was when I heard a pounding at the front door downstairs. I jumped out of bed and went out to the living room to listen. There was a man's screams from the other side. He was screaming, open up, pussy. I didn't acknowledge him. I didn't want him to know I was home. Then some random number was calling my phone. When I didn't pick up, I got a text from someone threatening to kill me and telling me to open the door before he breaks the window. I ignored these and called 911. I heard glass breaking from outside. I looked out my window and I saw a familiar, huge bearded guy right by my SUV. He was smashing my windows. I recognized the guy to be from Kelly's picture. As I was on the phone with 911, I explained that my crazy ex-girlfriend sent her current boyfriend to my house to threaten me and he was currently damaging my vehicle. I answered a bunch of questions as police were en route. All the while the man kept screaming things from outside and pounding on my door and sending threatening texts. Police showed up surprisingly quickly to my relief and they caught the guy still in front of my house. They saw him step off the front stoop after he saw the cop car pulling up. I went outside right away and showed the police my car and the texts. And the big, roid raging man was still yelling at me that I'm gonna fucking pay for talking shit about him to Kelly. I told him I hadn't spoken to Kelly in months and he said, oh yeah, what about the texts? as he was in handcuffs already. I said, what texts? And he accused me of being a bullshitter. So after he was brought away in one of two police cars, I gave the second police officer whatever information he needed of the situation between Kelly and I, and he told me I had a good case for harassment and should definitely file for a restraining order immediately. He told me to head to the precinct the next day, which is what I did, but I also unblocked Kelly and asked her what she said to her boyfriend and why and after she responded claiming she had no idea what I was talking about, I sent her a long text giving her a piece of my mind, basically telling her about my getting a restraining order and telling her to seek help. I never heard from her again, nor her crazy, roid-raging, now ex-boyfriend. According to my friend, she deleted the picture with him literally the next day after that happened. I currently have a restraining order against both her and her ex-boyfriend, Javier Cruz. Be careful who you decide to date. There's a whole lot of crazy out there.
I dated my ex Kian for two years. It was a toxic, abusive relationship. I endured a lot of physical suffering from it, but I was always too scared to leave it. I lived with my single mom on a rougher side of town, the place where I spent my entire childhood. Being a girl walking home alone at night here can be sketchy, which was part of the reason why I stayed with Kian for so long. He is a big guy and I felt a sense of protection with him when he wasn't making me feel like shit. A big reason I stayed with him though towards the end was because I was scared of how he'd take it if I broke up with him. My mother always hated him though, and she knew he was no good for me. Unfortunately, it took me as long as it did to cut ties with him. I did it over text one day though, because I knew if I did it in person he'd hit me or go crazy. He still didn't take it well. Seconds after I texted him, he tried calling me over and over. I wouldn't pick up because I was scared. So after the third or fourth attempted call, he started typing for a few minutes. And the text I got from him was a long paragraph cursing me out, a lot of it in all caps. I texted him back that we could talk about it on the phone tomorrow when he's cooled off. He of course sent another paragraph, and I didn't read this one right away because I was about to cry, and I didn't want to deal with it at that moment. My mom was working her second job that night and wouldn't be home till around 2 in the morning. I had class the next day, so I went to bed early around 10, but falling asleep was difficult with my mind racing. Eventually though, I did fall asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to a sound from the outside of my room. I looked at the clock and it was around 1am. It wasn't uncommon for me to wake up to my mom getting home late at night after work. I was just surprised because she was home rather early this night. I sat up and saw something sitting on the edge of my bed. I realized it was my cat Nala. I got out of bed and went out into the hall and called my mom's name. All the lights were out. I knew for certain I heard something from out in the living room. I turned on the living room lights, but no one was here. I went to the front door to make sure it was locked, and it was. I checked through the window to the driveway, and my mom's car wasn't here, so I figured maybe I was just hearing things. I went back to my room and shut the door, then crawled back into bed. Nala was still in the same spot on my bed. She hadn't moved. I tried to go back to sleep, and I suddenly heard another sound. I ran out to the living room again, and my mom wasn't here still. I suddenly realized, Kian knew where we kept the spare key in the backyard. What if he had just let himself in? I went back to my room and called my mom on my cell phone and told her. I had already texted her earlier about my breakup, so she already knew and was proud of me. She said she'd be home in a little bit, and that I could just be hearing house noises. I laid back down in my bed. Nala was still in the same position. I turned on the lamp and went to go pick her up, but I gasped when I saw her eyes lifelessly open and she wasn't breathing. I picked her up and confirmed it. My cat was dead. I wanted to cry, but I covered my mouth. I suddenly knew that Kian was in the house and that he did this to punish me. I locked my bedroom door and called 911 and whispered into the phone that my crazy ex-boyfriend broke into my house and killed my cat. I was told to wait in the closet in my bedroom until I heard the police arrive. I stayed on the phone with 911 in the closet, waiting. At any time during this, the front door to the house could have opened and closed and I wouldn't have been able to hear it. Eventually the 911 operator told me the police were there, apparently the door was unlocked because they let themselves in. That meant Kian had probably just left. I went to the living room to find two police officers. I was bawling my eyes out over Nala now. The first thing they asked was where is he, and I said I think he left. I showed them my cat and the text from Kian. My mom came home shortly after I called her, and she cried over Nala too. The police were not very helpful at all, saying without any actual evidence that someone broke into the house, they couldn't just go and arrest someone. Nala had no stab marks or anything, so as messed up as it sounds, we couldn't even prove that she was likely murdered by Kian as revenge to me. The next day, my mom had the locks to the house changed. The spare key in the backyard was still there, but Kian easily could have put it back. I blocked Kian's number and all social media outlets. All the evidence pointed to him having done it. My mother and I went through the process of getting an order of protection against him, and the judge issued us a temporary one before our court date. The last time I ever saw Kian was in court, where thankfully the judge determined that the order of protection would remain in place. I still often think about how the first time I went downstairs, Kian was probably somewhere in the living room, hiding and watching me.
when I was in junior year of high school, I had my first relationship. His name was Mike. He was a senior at a different high school the next town over. We met through Facebook. He messaged me and we started talking from there. We started hanging out and going to each other's games. I'd go to his football games, he'd come to my softball games. We officially became boyfriend-girlfriend after a few weeks. Since we were in high school though, we didn't go on a lot of traditional dates like dinner or drinks. We were just kids still. Our dates usually consisted of getting burritos, going for drives, or hanging out at his place since my parents were always home and made it awkward in case we wanted to do anything. The best way I could describe Mike, he was a bit of a hothead. He was big for a 17 year old, that's why he played football. But he didn't hang out with the jocks. He hung out more with the stoner crowd and the regular crowd. At least that's what he told me. I didn't go to the same school as him, so I didn't see who he was with during lunch. I also didn't really meet a lot of his friends. We mostly hung out just the two of us, as opposed to group things. Since he lived kind of far though, and I couldn't drive yet, it did get annoying. And truthfully, I started to develop feelings for this boy, Andrew, at my own school in my grade. Around the same time, I felt myself losing interest in Mike. I wanted to test things out with Andrew. So one night when Mike was asking to hang out, I asked him to pick me up so we could talk. He knew right away something was off when I said that. When he picked me up, we went for a drive, and I told him that I think we should take a break. He refused to accept that I was serious, and angrily demanded to know what he did. When I told him it's just that I felt the spark wasn't there anymore, he got so mad that he punched his dashboard, leaving a big indent in it. He started yelling and scaring me, so I was about to get out of the car, but he stopped me and put his hand on my shoulder and said no no no, and then asked me not to leave. He told me he's just angry, but that he'd drive me home. He put the car back in drive and started driving us. As we drove, he kept getting angrier as he kept asking for more details of what he did wrong. He started blowing stop signs and that's when I realized we weren't going in the direction of my parents' house. I asked him to pull over and let me out and he yelled no. We were approaching some wooded area and that's when I started getting really scared. I had never seen him like this before but he was showing me a crazy side of himself. I got out of the car when he stopped it on the side of some quiet road. He yelled for me to come back, but I didn't. My mom came to pick me up. Mike sent me an apology text later that night that I didn't respond to. Two nights later, I left my house to walk to Andrew's house, who I had plans to hang out with. He lived only two blocks away from me. On my way there, I spotted someone across the street, not too far behind me, walking about the same pace as me. They were wearing a hoodie with the hood up. I couldn't see their face. Foot traffic on our block wasn't too common, but it also wasn't super weird either. The closer I got to Andrew's house, the closer the person across the street got. As I continued up the street, I turned again and saw the person was now on the same side of the street as me. My heart started to race. I started walking faster. According to my phone, Andrew's house was coming up just on the right. I texted him to come outside please because I think I'm being followed. He replied back okay. I turned one more time as I heard the sound of shoes running on the sidewalk approaching from behind me and I saw the guy in the black hoodie running at me. I screamed and ran as fast as I could for about 5 seconds before seeing Andrew run to the front of his house in confusion. I turned around again and saw the guy in black running the opposite direction down the street. I keep saying the guy in black but I know it was Mike. That guy had an identical height to him from what I could tell. A few instances happened after that like getting calls with no caller ID and seeing Mike's car parked outside my parents' house in the middle of the night. My parents were aware of what was going on, and one day, my dad drove us over to Mike's house and knocked on the front door while I was in the car and had a long, loud talk with Mike's parents. I lowered the windows to listen, and most notably what my dad yelled was that he doesn't care how old Mike is, that it's still harassment, and if he keeps trying to contact me in any way, that we'd get police involved. It worked. Mike stopped trying to contact me after that. For those wondering, Andrew and I ended up dating for around a year. My relationship with Mike was an early lesson in my life to watch out for red flags.